Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Kate Seeley, Senior Vice President of the Middle East Institute. And we're so excited that you've joined us today for a panel about the very important role played by women uh, in the Middle East, using art and culture to build more stable, tolerant societies uh, during these very challenging times. Uh, a few housekeeping notes first. Uh, we are live streaming today's event on our website, uh, mei.edu. Uh, you can also find podcasts and webcasts um, tomorrow. We ask that you silence your phones, uh, but we encourage you to tweet about the event using our um, arts handle at MEI Arts Culture. I also want to bring to your attention uh, MEI's expansion campaign. We, uh, those of you who know us, know that this is a, a new building. It's a temporary building while we renovate uh, our original home around the corner on N Street. Uh, we need a bigger space to accommodate MEI's growing roster of policy experts, our growing educational programs, and our growing cultural uh, activities. And we hope to move into our new home in about 20 months' time. And what I'm most excited about is that this new home is going to feature an art gallery. It'll be a central feature of our arts and culture program and will showcase the very best in contemporary Middle Eastern art, uh, photography, and, and video. Uh, and it's gonna show the region's most socially and politically and exciting, uh, engaged and exciting art, uh, but will also serve as a platform for discussions between visiting artists, uh, their American peers, and other MEI stakeholders about ways to engage and to collaborate and to work together toward uh, a healthier uh, future in the region. So please pick up, we have downstairs as you go out, a pledge card uh, at the front desk on your way out and consider supporting MEI's expansion campaign or uh, our groundbreaking gallery. Now on to today's program. Uh, we have a brilliant group of panelists assembled here today, many of whom are artists. And they're here because their work is being featured in, in an exhibition uh, called uh, I Am, opening this Saturday, September 9th, at the American University Museum at the Katz and Arts Center. So please put it in your calendar and join us. The reception is from 6 to 9 p.m. on Saturday. I Am features the work of 31 acclaimed artists from 12 Middle Eastern countries and will be on uh, display until October 22nd. It's organized by the East-West Peacebuilding Arts nonprofit called Caravans, headed by Paul Gordon Chandler. And he's put on many exhibitions, including some exhibitions here in DC under that umbrella. I Am, uh, the exhibition we're gonna be talking about today, first opened in Amman under the patronage of Queen Rania, traveled to London, and is now uh, coming to DC. It showcases the insights and experiences of Middle Eastern women as they confront issues relating to religion, culture, and society in this rapidly changing Middle East. And it underscores through their art how women from the region are challenging stereotypes and misconceptions about the role that they play in the region in so many powerful ways. Uh, Paul is here with us today. Paul, please wave your hand so people can come find you afterwards and, and, and meet you. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the director of the Katzen, Jack Rasmussen, who's here with us today. Uh, thank you both so much for joining us. It is such uh, a pleasure and an honor uh, to be collaborating with two such highly esteemed institutions. Um, it really is uh, an exciting uh, collaboration. And I want to acknowledge MEI's Arts and Culture Director, uh, Lynn Snez, who has put so much work into making this collaboration possible. So thank you, Lynn. Um, we're very honored also to have this amazing group of panelists assembled. I'm not going to say more about them. I'm going to leave it to our moderator, um, Neda Ulabi. Uh, but thank you all for joining us. And a huge thanks to National Public Radio's Neda Ulabi, who's kindly agreed to moderate the discussion. Uh, Neda Ulabi reports on arts, entertainment, and culture, uh, cultural trends for NPR's Arts Desk, and in that capacity, does a lot of very cool and fun things and knows a lot about a lot of cool cultural things. Uh, she also hosted the Emmy uh, award-winning public television series, uh, Arab American Stories. And what makes her so essential to this conversation is that she's also very familiar with the Middle East and with women's issues. Neda was born in Amman, Jordan, and her family name, Ola, o, Olabi, uh, hails, to I'm it trying correctly for a while. in Arabic, <laughs> uh, hails from Syria. So Neda, I couldn't imagine a more perfect moderator. Thank you so much, and may I hand it over to you. Absolutely, and Kate, if you don't know, is a former colleague of mine at National Public Radio, and as I say, it's rare for people, at, even at NPR, to pronounce my name correctly, so it's, it's <laughs> lovely to hear for a change. Thank you all for coming so much today. This is 
a wonderful opportunity to be here. Let's move straight into introducing you to our wonderful panelists, starting with Alia Ali, who is a multimedia artist. She, one of her primary mediums is newspapers, which she uses to explore ideas about truth-telling and identity, which is especially fertile if you happen to be, and please let me know if I'm getting this right, an Austrian-born American of Yemeni and Bosnian heritage, correct? Yes, okay. <laughs> and residency in Morocco. And residency in Morocco. <laughs> now in the United States. Again, in response to this show's statement, I am, Alia is asking us back what to consider what she is not. Needless to say, her, her work pushes against stereotypes and the labels that, in her words, enable people to become victims and culprits all in one. So we're looking forward to having you tell us much more about that. Thank you so much for having me. Lulwa al khalifa is a visionary artist, right here. And by visionary artist, I mean she is entirely self-taught. Lulwa comes originally from Bahrain, and she was educated in Boston, where her children are now also in school, I've just learned. Um, we'll be talking to Lulwa about how her very cosmopolitan background informs a literally colorful career. As a painter, she works in bold strokes, as a person, she works in fine strokes when it comes to talking about the role of women in the Middle East and our representation in the art world. Um, Helen Zugrabe was born in Beirut, but she is a hometown girl. She lives here in DC and has for many, many years. You may have seen her work at the Library of Congress, at the White House, or at the World Bank, um, or at the, uh, at the Arab American Museum in Detroit, Michigan, where my father saw one of her exhibitions and absolutely raved about it. She served as a cultural env envoy through the State Department across the Middle East and in Europe, and her paintings have been used as official gifts of state by former President Obama and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Uh, last, and certainly not least, is Lyd Snedge, who is rooted in Lebanon and Damascus and Palestine. She is the d director of the Arts and Cultural Program here at MEI, and she's also worked for the British Council of Arts doing arts, or the British Council, forgive me, doing arts programming. So what we're gonna do is, um, I'm gonna ask you guys a very general question, and then we'll start talking about your work specifically and get a chance to get to know it a little bit better. There's a sense that I have as an arts reporter who covers the arts in the United States, but not specifically the Middle East, that Middle e the Middle Eastern art scene is super white hot right now. People talk about Dubai, people talk about Doha as, as very, very buzzy places in the arts world, but I'd like to hear from you what your experience exhibiting in the Middle East has been like. Um, is it overly dominated by extremely well-funded Gulf state acquisition committees and collectors? How would you describe the Middle Eastern art scene in its vastness right now? Helen, it looks like you. Maybe they can start, maybe. You because you're based. Start, yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here and also on a panel with such um, incredible women. Also, I wanted to take a moment to thank Paul Gordon for making this possible. Um, so in terms of this, I think um, thinking about the Middle East, I, that in itself is difficult for me because I look at it very much, especially with the artists that are exhibiting here, I look at it as West Asia and North Africa. Um, I know this, uh, I spent a lot of time now, I've spent seven years in Marrakesh, um, and so, and I've had the privilege for the first time to show in Dubai last um, for Art Dubai, so that was my sort of, and now I guess for in Jordan, um, but I wasn't there. And so Dubai, I don't know if I could really comment on it being there for one week, but what I can comment about being in Marrakesh is that Marrakesh is not only, and Morocco is not only a place that's exciting for the arts, it is absolutely fashionable. So right now I'm looking for a place, and this is not the story that we get. A lot of people are still afraid. Um, some of my friends who I would say, come and visit me in Marrakesh, come and um, you know, spend some time with me, come and vacation. They're still worried and they still use words like terrorists, um, being afraid to fly out, how they should, what they should dress, what they should um, wear. But they also, once I start telling them the story about events like the Marrakesh Biennial, which has absolutely become a very strong landmark, um, it, it's not an art fair, it's a biennial that's supposed to make art accessible to all classes, and absolutely it's, um, it has survived because it has been funded by foundations. It has been supported by the patronage um, of His Royal Majesty uh, King Mohammed VI. Um, it certainly has backings of banks and insurance companies, but there's also a lot that happens which are the grassroots. 
That being said, um, there's a lot of there's been a lot of foundation happening with the education institutions, um, how to uh, involve younger artists, artisans. Um, so, for example, I was just talking to Paul Gordon, and how they did that was basically by inviting artists into Morocco, both some of them that were from different parts of the region, North Africa and West Asia, who are already familiar of working within a, a situation where only Arabic and French and Amaziev might be used, um, using materials that are there. Um, so integrating with the public. So I do think that, um, yes, I do, I, I think that there's another vision within, and then there's a vision with, um, without, from outside. So that's something. And then what, what has your experience been like? Um, How would you describe it? Actually, the art scene in Bahrain has a, a very grassroots feel to it. Um, it's the oldest, um, uh, in terms of a movement, it's, it's the oldest within the Gulf. We've, we have had um, contemporary art in the Gulf since, in Bahrain since the 60s. So whereas Dubai and Qatar or all the other places are more flashy, if you will, um, they're recent additions to the to the art scene of the Gulf of Bahrain. We've had um, decades of you know artists expressing themselves and, and but it's still very much contained within the country itself and, and ho hopefully now we're starting to show our uh, work abroad and uh, you know reach out internationally but it's a very it's a beautiful feeling when you come to Bahrain and see that people are still very passionate about the work itself and uh, the diversity of the work itself and um, it's it's very it's a it's a welcoming community. I found you know um, I, 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 there's no animosity from from or or any of that you know or or um, superficiality or any of those things that are sometimes associated with the art world. Um, so from that aspect, um, I'm, I, I feel very fortunate to be from there, and uh, it's an exciting time to be a Bahraini artist because you know hopefully bigger and better things are are coming our way. Can you talk just a little bit more about how that how we would see that diversity in the art scene in Bahrain? Well, uh, we've had um, an art fair that is in its uh, that just celebrated its second edition this year, and hopefully it's going to continue. So that enables galleries from abroad to come into Bahrain and Bahraini artists to be introduced to galleries from abroad and just to broaden the the, um, the base for Bahraini artists and their reach. We also have some organizations that are um, taking Bahraini artists abroad and um, having exhibitions uh, in London, for instance, we had a few, and um, in India uh, later on this year. So there are Bahraini organizations that are taking Bahraini artists abroad and, and um, expanding their horizons, basically, and expanding their, their reach. And Helen, of course, you're based here, but you have exhibited internationally. Yeah. Yeah. What has your experience, that, how would you describe the art scene as you've experienced it in the Middle East? And as a woman, what has it been like for you within it? Um, well, I, do I have to speak a little bit? I think you, I think you do. Thank you, yeah. thank you, everybody. And I think we all probably have to lean in, so to speak, yeah. a little bit, right? Thank you. Thank you, Paul Gordon, everybody, for um, this incredible honor. Um, so yeah, I, I, I um, after I was evacuated from Beirut from the war, I didn't go back for 35 years. And when I did go back, um, I did a solo exhibition in Beirut, and I had no idea what to expect. Um, uh, I had been in some group exhibitions, but nothing at that concentrated level, and the work that I showed had really not a lot to do with the war. Um, a few pieces hark harken back to that. Um, but what I found from the people who came to the exhibit, bought my work, and from interviews that I did, they were so pleased to have something beyond the war, mm -hmm. which identified, and I get it, I do get it, but um, that was the rea reaction that I got from artists, from people, from interviewers, from people who wrote um, a very strong reaction to the work that was hopeful and positive with regards to Lebanon. I was recently invited to, by the State Department to go to Saudi Arabia as a cultural envoy, mm -hmm. and that was fascinating. I worked with um, Saudi Arabian women artists, and to get from 
talking a little bit about what you guys were uh, referring to, um, there is a, a certain amount of um, in, insularness, I don't know how to say that word, but you know, um, where they really want to get their work out and doing everything. That, there is a strong community there. Um, the women artists are amazing, and they need venues to show their work. Um, they want to promote themselves, um, and they themselves also are working within their constrictions. Uh, but um, I exhibited alongside of them and went to their universities, the Princess Nora. It was fascinating. Um, one young woman had, they don't have to wear their um, the abaya and the hijab in the university. And um, we were taking a tour, and she was an artist, and she was standing there, and her hair was completely blue. <laughs> so you would never know it. Um, I just went up to her, I was like touching her hair, you know, but um, fascinating and extremely talented um, from what I saw. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think that anyone in this room needs any explaining that Arab women and Middle Eastern women are incredibly tough and strong and mm -hmm. able to advocate for themselves in many, in many circumstances. The art world in the United States is horribly misogynistic. Um, what are the challenges that you have faced as women artists in the Middle East? And Ali, I'd like to start with you partly because you have a position of authority as the director of operations at the Marrakesh uh, Biennial, correct? Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. No, it's been, I only did that for two years, mm -hmm. and that was three and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, and it's, I think, not to speak within that light. I mean, I think more, if you're talking, um, I guess one, one second, as an administrator, yeah. very different than from a creative. So um, as an administrator, it's something different because I am Yemeni. Um, I'm not Moroccan. Um, I speak Arabic and English. I'm not very strong in French. I think this is where language within the region also becomes a question of power. Um, it becomes, when the, when the purpose of it is just to get things done, the purpose of it is just to communicate. In fact, language can actually do quite a disservice. It can do quite the opposite. Um, and so when you, for the sake of that, for example, language can save a lot about what class you're from. Mm -hmm. um, there, I don't need to, I think this is all very, there's also a difference of whether or not uh, what a Yemeni is to the other Arabs. There's also a lot of sometimes animosity. Um, I mean, I guess you can say the same with New York and Boston, right? <laughs> um, but uh, so, so there were certainly some challenges in that respect. Um, was it respect, was it, were there challenges as being a woman? Yes. specifically that you're asking, I would say no because I refuse to see it as such. Um, so if they were there, okay. I went to Wellesley College and I was educated um, not to acknowledge it. <laughs> and so I never really allowed it to acknowledge me, uh, acknowledge it. However, language for me did end up becoming some sort of a border. In terms of, as an artist, speaking as an artist, I'm really happy you bring that up because there was a gentleman who I was interviewed um, by and he said, do you find that there's a lot of difficulty? I mean, there's already such chauvinism and patriarchy within the Arab world. Do you find that in the art world? And I said, it's first of all, that's, there's so much misunderstanding here, but so I'm great. It's great that we're having this conversation. And I said that this is actually a, at least a, a career or a choice in which I find that women of the region are extremely empowered. Because going back to language, as we're talking about this, we're talking about visual language. It's still a communication, but it's something that's so much more universal than the verbal language. It's something that cr crosses borders between, you know, by B Iran, Yemen, um, different backgrounds of, you know, Lebanese, Syrian, North African, you name it, and of course, even farther than that. How do you get our experience and our message to South America? What about all of the people of the diaspora, which is really important that we forget about, you know, the Arabs of the diaspora who have this need, which I am as well, 
and you were mentioning this, we're all really of this diaspora because we, a lot of us have been educated outside. How do we unify that? So and for me, as an Arab artist, as an Arab female artist, there's so much question about what Arab women behind the veil or in the harem, you know, what are they, all this mystery. Well, it's very liberating to come out and say, well, this is the beauty. Please don't see us through our suffering. Please don't see us through these lenses that you visualize us as being um, tortured of our, of the mishaps of the violence. Please look at us through the beauty that we choose to put out. And art is an incredible platform for that. So I've found it extremely empowering. And I'll just add this one more thing, is that with when we're talking about institutions, if you look at some of the institutions and some of the art fairs, um, some of the um, biennials, if you look at who founded them, most of them are women. And that's incredible, because you don't see that in the rest of the world. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree completely. I, um, in terms of um, the art world in Bahrain being male-dominated, it's, it's, it's not a question at all. I've, I've never, actually, it's been my, my experience that we've been to several exhibitions where the majority were women. Um, and people always ask us, you know, oh, it's, it's so fascinating that the majority of the artists are women. and. It's not something that I ever thought about. You know, it was a the curator picked these works, and and that's what ended up, uh, you know, being exhibited. Um, I never felt that there was any sort of uh, issue with us, with me being a woman um, or an artist in Bahrain. But I think that's very indicative of Bahrain itself because we we've never had uh, a male female issue in Bahrain historically, anyway. Um, and so this is. Um, it's unique in the region, you know, even when we became a constitutional monarchy, there was never a question of voting, there was never a question of education, and men and women were educated at the same time. You know, we dress however we want to dress, do whatever we want to do, so that's very empowering. And when you hear about oppression and different stories around the world, you want to say, that's not my story. You know, so it's, it's back mm -hmm. to what you were saying. There is a view, there is a narrative where people sort of view Middle Eastern women. It's a lens that people look at Middle Eastern women through, but it's not a very accurate lens. It's a very blurry, and it's not the only story out there. You know, we are very nuanced, very diverse, and uh, that's what I want people to get from. from. It's, 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 it's hard to say Middle Eastern. That doesn't even mean yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. it, means you know, so it means so many things. I do want to push back a little bit before we move back to Helen. The story that the two of you have just told actually sounds very different for me than any woman artist I know in the United States. Um, the art world is a very sexist place, I think, across the world. And as Arab women, we are very used to having to push back against the narrative that we're always being oppressed. Mm -hmm. That said, the art world being the art world, it's, it has been this utopia that you describe. <laughs> well, what are the challenges of women artists specifically in, the, in Marrakesh, in, in Bahrain? I think it's the artist, the, the challenge of artists in general, mm -hmm. not women artists. You know, artists mm -hmm. struggle to show their work and, and be appreciated, and to, but that's a universal struggle. It's not a gender specific struggle. That's. I will, I will say one more thing as well. Also, our definition of what is an artist. So um, I always think that it's, I'm, I'm quite lucky being a visual artist because while well, I chose to do this, I'm very grateful, I'm thankful that, and that I can also work to do this. But being a visual artist, I can choose when I want to collaborate. Mm. We're also not including, when we're using the word artist, when we're thinking about musicians who are artists, sure. Um, my husband is a musician, and 80%, maybe even 90% of the time, they have to collaborate with other people in order to produce some sort of music. I, I see it so much, and perhaps in relation, I do see that there is quite a lot of, um, even, and that one certainly in the United States, now living in New Orleans, the amount trying to just find a female bassist or a female saxophonist we're not even talking about whether or not they're Arab, Middle Eastern, or whatever. We're just talking about being a woman. Um, certainly, that's the case. Um, I guess in my experience within, and that's the only thing that I can speak of, my specific experience is that within this as well, and perhaps it also really helps, and I'm not going to deny that, the fact that I have come from a school um, which defines me a lot and has a very strong um, sisterhood and family 
that um, where everybody's required to take art history, even if you're going to become a doctor, <laughs> or it doesn't matter, but everybody in their first two years are required to take art history, Wellesley. Um, and later on, also being that support and acknowledging that sisterhood. I think for that, I'm very lucky. Um, and that probably gives me a skewed version from what some other people possibly. Or we could call it a more evolved version. <laughs> Thank you, exactly. Um, and so hopefully that, and of course all of us, you're talking about have, being um, Arab women, West Asian women, North African, being very strong and aggressive, but it's also because we have such a very strong foundation, which our mothers, our aunts, our mother's friends who are aunts. <laughs> and okay, so yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think, I think we're also talking about labels. Mm -hmm. And first of all, the label of just being a woman is mm -hmm. a label. And um, a long time, I've had this conversation. Oh, two. I've had this conversation. Oh, thank you. Um, I've had this conversation with um, uh, Dagmar in, in the audience a while ago about a label of, of being a woman artist, let alone being an Arab American woman artist, more labels. And do you fight that or do you go with it? Um, you know, as you said, the, the scene of Arab, the interest of, of uh, Arab art, I think for me, after 9-11, has, you know, I don't know if you guys were here, not you, but um, that one of the uh, results of 9-11 being an artist is this incredible, yes, there was a lot of stereotyping um, and anti-Arab American, anti-Muslim uh, sentiment, surely, um, which I personally felt. Um, but beyond that, there then begot, became this sort of wanting to know what is, I'm going to say Middle East, Oh, yeah, yeah. What, what, who, who are these Arabs? What, what do they? And I think that we then, at that point, could be, uh, get our stories out. As you say, we want to tell our own stories. We don't want someone else to tell our stories for us, um, which is, I think, is important. So, for me, you know, there was a, a, an example of a woman artist who was invited to exhibit, I think, at the Women's Museum here in Washington, um, and she said no, and. Um, because she didn't want to be in a women's museum. Like, there's not a man's museum, like what you were saying. Was, it goes she a little bit. She didn't want to be stereotyped no. or ghetto no. Believe me, if, if someone from the women's museum wants to exhibit my work, I'm going. I don't care what you want to call me. Honestly, I'll be there in my paintings. I'm running, running right now. But I mean, so, so it's this quandary. Then the woman, and then on top of that, you add the fact of your background as an Arab, the stereotypes that we fight of male dominance, and, and I don't know which one said uh, we're, it's our language getting it out visually um, as opposed to verbally. I think we can all express ourselves better visually, at least I can, um, and, and then that serves as a, as a discussion point. Um, I use the abaya in, in a lot of my work, um, and always when I'm talking or exhibiting about it, um, I'll get these comments about, oh, it's oppressive, it's this, you know. And I remember at the Arab American National Museum, actually, uh, also an Arab American uh, play, uh, she's a screen, uh, she's an actress and writes plays. She did a one woman show. Do you remember who? Layla Buck. Oh, yeah. Oh. And, um, and she did pantomime. It was fascinating. Um, we were in a small room in the museum. And um, it's for the first Yuan there. And she just acted out a woman getting ready for a date. So we know this. She started like plucking her eyebrows and teasing her hair and cinching in her waist and putting on the horrible stockings and the high <laughs> shoes and this out and that there and that and makeup and maquillage and everything like that. OK, so what's oppressive? We're doing that for a man. Right, and so there's all these layers and layers to what it means to be a woman, what you wear, what's you know. I mean, I th I think it's so fascinating all this. So when people say wearing a buyer is oppressive, well, just think about it in another way as well. You know, um, I I think there's always an element of, at least I feel it, trying to prove yourself as as a woman, as an artist. 
I don't know if that goes away. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yes. Well, let's move to your visual mm -hmm. language. Um, can we can we start by looking at one of um, at Alia's slides um, on the and uh, if you, if you're comfortable doing so, Alia, it, it would be great if um, once once the images appear, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about the work that that we will hopefully see <laughs> in very short order. Be honored. Thank you. <laughs> Technical difficulty. Oh, that's seems that's actually mine. Okay, great. Let's start with Helen. Sorry. No, it's beautiful. <laughs> we'll really go with what technology tells us. <laughs> I'm actually excited to hear about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's and this some... is the acrobatic part of the. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. It's cool. It's all right. Um, so I can't tell how the colors are there, um, but um, that's the first piece I did. Um, called Arab Spring, and I mentioned that I had gone back to Lebanon uh, for the first time, and shortly after I, Syria and Jordan, was shortly after I, um, my father was born in Damascus, so I finally went and saw where he was born. Um, and a few months after we arrived back in America, uh, we had the Arab Spring there. So the, the first piece, um, the woman <coughs> with the flowers, is the first piece I did um, using that motif of the flower as a, a symbol of beauty and hope and optimism, which many Arabs, um, women, everyone certainly had the intention of at the beginning of the Arab Spring. Um, six, over six years later, I'm still working on this mm -hmm. whole concept um, and the devolution now, maybe, and the aftermath. and. Um, focusing on the Syrian uh, war and uh, the resulting migration, and um, referring also coming back here to America, the immigration issues and so on, so we're all tied up together. This, the uh, second piece is called Generations Lost, and um, not this one, the, the other one. Um, if you can get it up, I don't know. Yeah, that piece. Um, that's a, a large piece. I work in, <clears throat> sorry, in gouache. And it was inspired by a photograph of a woman who lost her son. And, um, you know, I call it generations lost, and the women are going off the page. Uh, I, I think also, too, here that the pattern and the beauty and the, the, col the um, colors of the, of the work the reason I do that, and it seems a bit um, contrary to the message I'm trying to tell, I'm trying to attract you to my work first, so you can hear what I have to say, talking about the vis uh, you know, visual language. or, um, And so the, the colors and the patterns and the beauty of the woman, um, I want to emphasize in the work as well. We're, we're not all a sad story, that's right. Mm -hmm. There is still that hope and that optimism that I myself try and do in my work better than how I'm speaking right now. Um, so, yeah, that's that piece. You know, I was going to ask you how you saw your work fitting into the theme of the exhibition I Am, but I, I think you answered that good, question. Good, good, so I'm going to have to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> and and just, to be, just to be clear, in, in case people don't know this, this is an exhibition that started in Jordan, it's been shown in London, now it's in, in D.C. Let's, uh, let's see who we have up next. It's a, it's a, a mystery. mystery. <laughs> it's a mystery. Uh, well, artist, artist. Yeah. Um, so it was, you know, I think all works, are, all artwork is like your children, so it's very hard yeah. to pick. Yeah. So initially when I sent this to Jessica, I sent them for 21 of them, and yeah, they said, that. please pick. <laughs> I know, I know, I agree with you. Ah, so, it's horrible. Um, I thought these two were poignant. Um, so I'm, I'm actually textile based. I'm a photographer, um, um, mostly, and I always work with textile, or at least I have been for the last three and a half years. Um, textile being something that's so important. 
um, in growing up. So when I grew up, whenever I would have an excellent grade or when I graduated or if somebody, you know, when I got engaged, I was given jewelry, okay, but I was giving extremely precious pieces of fabric. And um, something that I realized also traveling around different parts of the Muslim world is that a lot of women tend to have incredible chests filled with exotic fabrics and stories. So to me, this was an intimate way of truly understanding the story of that individual and through that and the culture through that individual through these textiles. So this became sort of the, um, the textiles ended up becoming because they told stories, they also became this um, way of talking about borders somehow and barriers, this physical object that somehow comments on the fabricated barriers the, that we've created to divide you from me to you, me, and everyone. Um, so the two works that I showed, so when I also, I also create installations actually using the fabric within the photographs. Um, so they usually tend to be one off, only, you can only experience it there. Like my professor said, even if you had the same fabric and the same photographs, make sure that every show is different because there's one person who will always be at your exhibitions and that's yourself. So it should be new. And the one-on-one that I did, um, these installations are essentially very intricate, complex frames for the photographs. Um, so they are two-dimensional. This work right here is called Election, and it was inspired in 2016, um, 2006, excuse me, 2015, the end of 2015, 2016, during the elections um, in the United States. Um, very quickly, I'm Yemeni Bosnian. Um, I, was, I was naturalized in uh, 1998. Uh, I felt I feel very equally these three things, and that's why it's very important for me to say that I'm Yemeni, Bosnian, American. Um, while some of them are blood, being American, while it's taken a lot from me after September 11th, and I stopped speaking Arabic and forgot Arabic, and I blame September 11th for stealing my language from me, it's because I went to Wellesley College, it's an American school, it's because I have the blue passport that I can travel around the world and criticize my government. So I take it very personally, the politics that are happening now. And yet I am also a Yemeni. And so for election, um, I created this piece which was with florals, black and white florals, uh, that is two and a half meters um, by 100, um, two, yeah, 250 centimeters by 180 printed on aluminum dye bond. You sit at a table that has been upholstered in the same fabric, so when you sit very close, you don't actually realize that you're looking at a body that is being covered. Um, so it's business as usual. Business happens across the table. Politics happen across the table, distracted by extremes that are only black and white. Um, and floral, but while we're having these conversations and discussions, we actually forget the humanity that's under it. We forget that the United States is actually involved in seven wars at the moment, one of which is my country and has actually decided to be the worst humanitarian crisis at the moment, and yet it's not being featured in the news. So the question here, and I think good art questions, I hope that this raises questions that doesn't give you answers. Is it a fetus underneath? Is it a body? Is it a birth? Um, but whatever it is, it's being ignored and it's the largest thing in the room. So that work is called Election. Um, the other work which I created, thank you so much for the opportunity of creating this work. It was really important and I didn't realize that I needed to get this out. You mentioned that one of them was about newspaper. I actually found this, fab this newspaper that was rolled and then it was woven into this fabric and it was, um, it was essentially gonna be thrown away and I, I used it because one of the things about I am when I started thinking about I am and the pressure of having to say what I am. Mm -hmm. And you said it so beautifully, Helen, it's the labels. Like the labels because who is creating the labels? What, what does a Muslim look like? My mother is from Bosnia and she's blonde, blue-eyed Muslim. Um, drives, very well educated, and when you look at her, you think that she's European, maybe Christian, but you would never think that that's a Muslim. She fasts, she, you know, so what does a Muslim look like? You know, what does an Arab look like? Do I look like I'm an Arab? You know, what does, what are all of these? And so one thing throughout 
growing up, I think a big part of growing up and why becoming an artist was no, cho it wasn't a choice, it was a necessity. Mm -hmm. Because you're also talking about this need for your soul to communicate, is in order to find, to know thyself. And the only way to know thyself and to know about peace and to try to do, is about getting, understanding yourself better. And I'll, I don't think I'll ever know what I am, but throughout life I'm figuring out what I'm not. And a good way of figuring that out is reading the news. <laughs> and realizing how the news has somehow categorized me into these specific things. Well, this is what a Muslim looks like. If you go to a madrasa, this is what the madrasa looks like. Um, you know, this is what an Arab looks like, you know, wearing an abaya, being this, being oppressed, and so on. So what I did say, this essentially, this body of work was not, not just one, but has now come up to 12 pieces. Um, and uh, and I, I'm still working on it. it. It's almost about creating this shield we are almost in this double word of alien, you know, the legal term alien, we are the other. The other has always become vilified because it's something that we don't know. And so these characters, the, div, the, div, the thing that divides me, these are auto portraits, by the way, I'm underneath that as well. So I'm playing the observer and the observed. Um, and in that, I also use the news to look at other people. And so while I become the victim of the news, I'm also the culprit, and I want to make sure that everybody who sees it recognizes that as well. And now we have Lulua's work. Um, and uh, you work in both abstraction and figurative work. I do. Is that right? Yes. And this is work that is in I Am? Yes, uh, the, the other one, the, the green, uh, the, the other lady. <laughs> Actually, Alia said, everything I wanted to say, I think, much more eloquently <laughs> than <laughs> um, But it's basically the same theme. Uh, you were talking about labels, and uh, I was inspired by perceptions. You know, she is behind those white lines, so her perception of the world is hindered by those white lines. And the world's perception of her is also hindered by those white lines. So we are both prisoner and... Um, creator basically of our own prison because you know nobody put these white lines out there you know we create them or society creates them or people label you and put you in a box of their creation but we allow it to happen and this is what inspired me for these um, works and I didn't want them to be uh, you know Arab centric or you know these women could be from anywhere the, uh, the, the work could be done by anyone um, and that's um, what inspires me, I don't like boxes, and uh, this is what, um, what these works were about. It's basically a series that I'm working on now, and it's all you know, women from d with different expressions, different you know, looks, and, and, and it's funny how people come in and talk to you about them. Oh, she's so sad. Oh, you know, what's wrong with her? And maybe she's bored. Maybe she's thinking about dinner. You know, it's, it's all about your own you, 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 you know, you project onto the work as you're speaking about the work as well. So it's all about perception, and that's, that's what inspired me with these works. It's so funny, because I saw them, and I didn't think she's so sad. I thought, oh, it's in the tradition of Frida Kahlo and Tamara de la Pinca. Ooh. <laughs> Lips and eyebrows. And <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, what are they called, and they are in the show? It's from the outside, from the outside one, and from the outside two. Oh, wow. So this is a question that I'm going to now throw to you, Lynn, because you've been far too quiet for far too long. And that is how you feel, but of course I, I'm very eager to also hear how, what you think, how the arts can play a role in peacekeeping and in creating stable societies, especially when arts is so often a symbol between the haves and the have-nots, mm -hmm. which in so much of the developing world is an enormous chasm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. There, you know, this rich conversation. There is so much to pick from, and I, I'm um, first. Neda, I think that the arts in the Middle East have played a huge role um, in both providing space for very important homegrown conversations to take place, and they have triggered a huge interest internationally in looking at the region from a very different lens. And you know, my colleagues here have spoken about this. Because the arts are 
really the most intimate things about us. They are about who we are, how we live, our language, how we dress, our nuances, our representation. And I heard from the conversations the role of the arts in not talking about the other, but talking about us, uh, the, the role of the arts in providing a space for us to figure out what is our narrative and what is it that we want it to be? How do we want to be represented? And when there is no space for this to happen, you really can't engage in your own community or internationally. And I think for the Middle East, the arts before the, 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 what is known as the Arab Spring even, and through the Arab Spring have been, they, they, there has been an explosion of the arts where women, younger generations have embraced this medium to actually articulate that narrative and almost reclaim something that they want to control, that they want to find a way to articulate. So I think it's a huge positive story from the Middle East that we all need to be telling because it is providing um, both intercultural dialogue and I am is one example of how the arts can do that. But even back home, the arts are providing a way for societies to collectively work together to come up with narratives that uh, they are comfortable with. Are there examples that you can think of or sure. that you can think of in, or, or, and perhaps have created in, in your own work? Sure, I, I mean, one of the ways where the arts, you know, you, you've uh, mentioned the, you know, the fact that historically the arts have been very, you know, quite elitist and they, there is this gap between the access to the arts, which remains a huge problem everywhere, everywhere I think, including, but, here. including here, but in the Middle East. But the, what we have seen as well is a, a rise in the arts playing a stronger role also in the civil society um, and in those conversations where people embrace the arts as a way to practice the tools that are necessary for a society to move forward. Um, and, you know, I can give one example, for example, of a young woman creator during that period of the, um, Arab, uh, the Arab Spring from Jordan, from Amman, actually. Um, and during that time, debate, um, you know, there was debate about everything. People felt that you know they could speak, they could discuss things in cafes and in the streets, and and of course it overspilled to a lot of the sectors, including the arts and culture sector. So one of the examples that this young woman creator came uh, up with was um, a project called the Complaint Choir, where you know there was a call to the community to sign up and come together and decide what is it that they want to talk about. And, you know, they did the lyrics together, the, the rehearse it together, they went around the country. Now, this is the arts and um, providing communities access to something none of them had sang before or been part of a choir, but this is one example of how the arts can provide tools for communities in a very non-violent way to actually decide collectively and work collectively to move forward on some issues. Now, this is very different art, but this is also providing um, access to the arts as a way for people to reflect and um, to be able to practice uh, the dialogue and um, community together. And I think that is hugely important. Um, as, as artistic creators, as innovators, as people who practice art in many, many different places, um, and who help make artistic communities. What are examples that you three can think of as moments where people have used arts as a, as a place of resistance? I could just say a couple of things. Into um, the microphone. Oh, I, um, sure. So I'm gonna go back a little few years after 9-11 as a, a reference point. And you mentioned my show at the Arab American National Museum. So my father was born in Damascus. 
uh, in the old city, and then he was in, at the time he was born, it was the big Syria, so Lebanon was just a small mountain uh, in, uh, in Syria. So he's a storyteller, and so I began um, painting his stories, um, ultimately ending up with immigrating to America. And when we exhibited them, we had the paintings and the stories, so Americans, Western audience, because they were first exhibited here, um, could read that, you know, here are civilized people. Mm. They want education for their families. They have traditions. They're just the same as you are. They're not the other. They're Christian Arabs. They're Muslim. There's mm -hmm. Greek Orthodox. In my family, there's everything. We have Muslim. We have Greek Orthodox. We have everything that's in there. Um, and I think that was a, 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 a way of um, dispelling and um, certain stereotypes that we, we do fight against. Um, and another example of what you, you were talking about, that we want to um, say who we are it, with authenticity and with our own voice. And, um, you know, it was sort of a visual and the, the painting and the written word, his true stories, um, you know, for people to, to absorb and change their minds about, you know, who are Arabs, yeah, mm -hmm. especially after 9-11. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Are there specific examples that you can think of as how art really has been some sort of meaningful form of resistance in the communities in which you live and, and create art? Um, Absolutely. So much <laughs> that's coming out of this right now. It's so great. Um, I think uh, I, can't, I can't help but think um, one of my mentors uh, years ago told me that the, the real work actually only starts when you put the work up. So all of everything that happens before that is you yourself and your, your intimate self. After that, that's when you become vulnerable. That's when you show it. So I do think that the point of making art accessible is integral. Um, something for me that I, because of that, I try to do at every exhibition is, and everybody who's put on exhibitions, whether or not they're galleries, whether or not they're foundations, have been very supportive in me being available for the week after. Um, why? Because sometimes to me I believe that, the, that art in itself does not only stand as something beautiful, as something while it should raise questions, it's also there to garner dialogue. And it's fascinating once you put artwork up, if I were to have a conversation with you about that artwork, and with you, and with you, I'll have three completely different conversations about different types of politics, about different stories. It might remind you of your grandmother, it might remind you of the war, um, but it's fascinating how people put themselves into the work, and that's really how I end up getting to know the communities, what's important to them, and that feeds the next body of work. This is how I think that work, and for the better sense of the word is that the artwork, become, artwork becomes a prop to develop peace building. It becomes this tool in which all of the gold happens. While it's there, it gives you purpose. A lot of the gold is what happens within the community and within the people. And for that, the, the amount of work that comes after those dialogues is a lot. And that's a lot of material to work from. And one body of work that I would probably talk about was a work that was inspired by a term that was used during the campaign um, where uh, Mexicans were seen, were called rapists. Mm -hmm. And I was in New Orleans and I realized that at this point, I had already become somehow desensitized to all the hatred that was coming towards Muslims and Arabs, which is very dangerous. And that kind of shocked me. And I saw that and I thought, wow, it's not just about us. And it's about women. It's about um, all kinds of communities. And so I um, started a project that was initially called the People of Pattern. And I thought, how would people, and when you're talking about the abaya, this is why this comes in, because I work with fabric being covering people. And um, what if you look at fabric as, a, as visual stories? My grandmother was illiterate. She's a tribeswoman from Qubayta in Ta'iz, um, extremely wise. Um, she was uh, 
she was a Lerhama, an elder, she just recently passed away, an elder of the region and very highly respected, but she also worked with textiles. And this is how she told her stories through the symbolism of the Ain, of the evil eye, it became a shield. It was a reflection, these fabrics are essentially a reflection of what the environment looks like around the animals, the the, the plants, the, the people, and it's not women who are totally covered in black, in fact, covered, but totally in color. And um, so I would, and they wore these fabrics all the time, and so I started this project by creating these portraits of people, and it started with my father in these fabrics that my grandmother had made, entirely enveloped in them. And then I traveled to Mexico and I did the same thing. So these fabrics, how would these countries talk about, or these regions, talk about their culture and their history on their own terms visually, not verbally, not through English, not through a colonial language, not through Spanish or whatever. How would they do it visually? So I did, and I ended up traveling to 11 regions of the world, including Uzbekistan, Malaysia, Japan, Nigeria, Kenya. And um, now these works stand as themselves as a work of resistance. And everywhere that I've shown it, it's now moving. I insist on doing workshops, and I insist on doing a talk. Um, and I think us as artists, we're allowed to do that. While it's not visual, while it doesn't have to be verbal, it's not verbal, you have to make yourself available to have this conversation. Because if you're raising the questions, then you're also allowed to learn from what people are telling you around. And we have to be open to look at our art differently based off of how people see it. And this has been an incredible wealth um, that was inspired by hate and essentially has become something that brought communities together. And the work is now called Borderland. And um, when I was in um, Palestine, um, I, I oh, sorry, sorry. Now, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. When I was in Palestine, um, I ended up doing a piece based on the embroidery. And of mm. course, you can tell uh, the woman's village, yeah. um, their village from the, what they embroider. And I, I did a piece called Another Wall, um, also the, talking about barriers. but. Uh, very inspired by this woman's work, uh, uh, also a, a way of resistance as well, passed down from generation to generation, uh, mother to daughter, and so on and so forth. And um, yeah, you can just tell where, what village she's from by her um, thobe. Absolutely. And um, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. It says everything. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it becomes another skin. Sure, yeah. I mean, we already look at each other and we judge each other by the color of, of our course. skin, by... Mm -hmm. oh, whether or not we're made up or whatever. Absolutely. And so when you're looking at, well, we might as well look at something beautiful and rich like the textiles that yeah. we have. And yeah. always the veil comes up as yeah, a conversation. Yeah, yeah. So it's great, let's move that out of the way. And then yes, talk it, about the real It's thing. like a subversive way. I, I say that about my work. Oh yeah, well, it's the colors and the patterns and so I'm gonna attract you. But then I'm gonna force you to hear what I have to say. You know, <laughs> So there's this element of subversiveness there too, which, if I'm repelling you, you're not going to listen to anything what I say. You know, that's how I approach that. So with those pieces there. Yeah. And that's interesting because it makes it universal. If I were to take a photograph of my grandmother whose eyes, whose face, you can yeah. see my fa her face in the textile, yeah. people will say, well, that's National Geographic, very nice. Yeah. That's the other. <laughs> but if you remove the eye, the first thing that we see that connects each other, and you just base it off of these symbols, mm -hmm. there's something else that's drawn where there's this confusion. And I think good art makes you uncomfortable to a point. At least some of the work that has moved me the most in my life are ones that I left being like, I don't know why that just made me so angry or I don't know why I feel really uncomfortable. I really didn't like it. And eventually it was because there was something within me that didn't settle well, but has actually inspired and moved mm -hmm. me for that mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. You know, just carving out the psychic space to tell your story on a canvas can be an act of resistance. I think that, that it would be universal for almost any artist. For you, what are the acts of resistance that you have witnessed as a participant in an artistic community or that have been part of your own life? I actually want to f flip that question around, if I, if I may. Mm -hmm. I think that there's an expectation for a Middle Eastern artwork mm -hmm. or a Middle Eastern show to have a sort of a political element or to show some kind of resistance or some, have some kind of angst or, you know, which is absolutely valid. It's, it's, 
but there is a, a, a you know another side of that you know a painting can just be a painting and, and you can appreciate the colors and you can appreciate the strokes and and that I mean you don't look at a Matisse and think what did he, what what, what mm -hmm. politically you know motivated or a Monet or you know a water lilies or we don't have that idea coming into you know a, a sort of a Western yeah. uh, painter's work and it's a shame that we do have that when it comes to the you know, Arab or, or Middle Eastern uh, works. And um, I don't think that that's necessarily true or that that's what makes them valid. You know, there is a validity to, to, to a political statement behind a piece or if that's the story you want to tell, if, that, mm -hmm. if that's what motivates you. Or, but there's another aspect, you know, just an inspiration that comes from beauty or all oh, these colors or that's why that's what I'm drawn to when I'm doing my abstract work it's it's the movement of the war of the paint of the you know of, so it's it's a very sort of visceral happy kind of not always happy but you know what I mean there's nothing no political connotation whatsoever and that's where I'm coming from I don't feel that everything has to have a sort of a you know, a fight behind it. Or, and I think that's sort of a requirement for a Middle Eastern artist's work right now. And that's, a, it, it hinders you from, from showing your work in certain places because they're like, oh, but you know, how is this Middle Eastern? You know, or why is this relevant? Which is a shame, I think. I, I think it's just that we're so bombarded with, sorry for the word, literally bombarded with um, so much news, negative news and sadness from the Middle East. Um, you know, if I, I'm focusing on the Syrian situation, of course the Yemeni, but close to me, right? Um, it's very difficult for me to um, paint something that doesn't talk about what I am really trying to emotionally connect to, and I don't want people to forget. I mean, it can get, be on the newspaper for days and then off the newspaper, you know? Um, so I, I, I find that a motivating factor for my work. So I totally get what you're saying. I think you're right. And unfortunately, so much of the world's problems right now are focused in the Arab world. And that is, I think, part of some of the, what we're talking about, you know, in terms of addressing it um, as opposed to not addressing it at all. Yeah, as long as you acknowledge that that's not the only story of course. or that's not the only motivation of course of and i think you know when we sort of want to know about each other or learn about each other it's it's it's, it's important to learn about you know the differences or what's happening or everything but what ultimately brings us together is, is the sameness. Similarity, yeah. right, exactly. You know, everything that the, the mundane sure. brings us together, you of know, the, the, the everyday brings us together. So that's also something mm -hmm. worth exploring. Mm -hmm. okay. But I think every inspiration is valid, and, and, yeah. but it, 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 hurt, it, it annoys me that it's the only mm -hmm. story. You know, yeah. It's a problem. I, yes, yes, this is, um, I'm gonna jump in. This is a conversation that often uh, takes place. There are, um, you know, there there are many artists in the region that feel that they, you know, because they come from the, this region, they carry this heavy weight on their shoulder. That their, you know, their work has to be politically engaged and socially engaged. And I think this is a very personal um, uh, story as well, um, as you said and as uh, Lulwa uh, said as well. You know, the, it is. It is possibly difficult for an artist who is living um, very intense uh, times of political upheaval or social change or whatever to be disjointed from a situation that is impacting his or her day-to-day -day life, whereas it is completely um, um, valid for an artist who is creating art and happens to be in the Arab world to be creating art that has a different message or a message that transcends the political conversation or is universal as we say art is universal and is you know on on this idea building on the idea of our togetherness and our um, us rather than the other just being there and putting their art as a as a way of uh, communication and as a as a way of reaching out there are so many conversations to be had about the arts. There are conversations about the arts as a, a, an economic generation uh, uh, plan, and we've seen many countries as well in the Middle East invest in the art and invest in, in, in that 
because that is also, uh, you know, that there, there is an explosion in the creative industries as well in, in the region. And that is also uh, another conversation in, in, in the arts and some countries are using this um, to actually generate more um, employment for women and more spaces for um, societies to be able to come together and have the necessary conversations, also putting them, the, the, putting the country on the map in a very different way. And, and, and that is also a very different conversation of nation building and of image changing. And, and, and all of these come into play, I think, in how um, we want to represent ourselves. And I think the arts um, are at the crossroads of many of those conversations. Right before we turn questions over to you, let me ask you really quickly, Lynn, can you, can you encapsulate for us a little bit about the new creative economies in the Middle East and specifically how women may be driving those? Uh, the creative economies are um, rapidly expanding um, in the Middle East, very differently though. Um, there is huge investment in, in the Gulf and in Saudi Arabia in, in the infrastructure that is necessary for uh, those creative industries to prosper. Uh, there is um, a strategy that is clear to um, equip, train, provide opportunities for the employment um, of a large uh, section of the younger population as well women um, in those industries. Um, those industries require uh, uh, vision and infrastructure. They're, they're very interesting, they're innovative, they're very, um, you know, they're, they, they're very attractive for this younger generation. Um, and the situation is slightly different in other areas, in other regions, in other countries in the Middle East, sorry, um, countries perhaps in the Levant, uh, that are in a, di in a different uh, situation at the moment where we can talk about a very vibrant art scene, but perhaps not, uh, 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 no strategy in actually providing infrastructure for the uh, rise of a, an economic sector known as the creative industries in, in a similar way as to the Gulf, where you have, you know, uh, infrastructure of museums, foundations, uh, um, uh, internet city and design city, and, you know, uh, where the infrastructure in terms of um, housing and internet and all that is required for that sort of sector to, to grow and rise uh, is, is required. However, the creative industries rely on one thing, which is your ideas. And those ideas are proliferating in the Middle East. You know, young people are, you know, using the arts, whether they have the infrastructure or not. In fact, one of the reasons why the arts have unleashed such an explosion of work since uh, what we know as the Arab Spring is because when, when, when the restrictions in some countries sort of collapsed, the arts felt that they were finally liberated. Mm -hmm. They came out of the confines where uh, they had to be in before. And they, you know, we had the rise of a participatory art in the streets. We had people, graffiti. you know, graffiti mm -hmm. art. We had mm -hmm. people almost reclaiming physically their cities, wanting to leave a trace, wanting to occupy them with song, with performing arts, with dance, with graffiti. You even felt the need to actually leave a trace mm -hmm. that this is ours. We want to reclaim it. This is our story. This is our space. And both are based in the arts, whether it is a planned, um, um, a planned investment to actually use the arts as a nation building project where the arts are seen um, as an economic pillar uh, for the country to employ young people, to uh, provide uh, spaces for the society to to grow, whether it is a sector that is used for a society to get together and um, to 
address, uh, to articulate their ambitions, their demand to address a community abroad, an international community that is seeing them through only one lens. Mm. All of them are valid. And the arts are center to all of them. Let's get your ideas and questions. Um, do we have a microphone? We do. The young lady in the back has one. Um, the gentleman in the with a raised hand in the back. Um, would you please say your name into your microphone and any association that might be helpful for us? Uh, sure, my name is Nizar Farsakh. I'm a leadership and advocacy uh, trainer, in fact. Thank you for a fascinating um, uh, session. My question leads, uh, builds from what you said. In your work, if you can give examples of how you ma navigated uh, the boundaries, the things that could be said, could not be said, the taboos, uh, in ways that you felt actually managed to, as uh, Ms. Ali said, like to actually engage in a dialogue about issues that people were not discussing. Like there is a sense there where something needs to be addressed and people are not addressing it. And a lot of these restrictions are in fact not government, but in fact the society's mm -hmm. restrictions. And I'm saying that because one of the ways or one of the definitions of leadership that I think are very good is that leadership is about disappointing people at the rate that they can tolerate. So what were ways that you saw that art was the most effective way to address an, a, a social ill that you thought uh, were, was effective? Thank you. To disappoint people. Panelists? <laughs> yeah, I think um, that was such a great question. Thank you yeah. so much. Um, I think it depends on what communities um, you're looking at. And right now, I can't help but think about the United States. It's a big reason why I do, th I do think that art is political. I think um, from some of the conversation that happened here, I'm lucky to be living on the border. So a lot of the work that I do about um, my Arab roots and Muslim roots is beautiful and positive. I think it was so pertinent what you said. Mm -hmm. but, and a lot of the things that I see, that a lot of the work that I do critical is also to something that I feel very personal about, pers personal about and it's my Americanness. And um, at the moment, it's the reason why I have decided to become, to come and move to the United States and be here 80% of the time because I feel like my work is more relevant here and necessary to get into the dialogue and some of the questions that I'm in asking, not only because it's something that I want people, not because I have any answers, to be honest, because I'm questioning how did this happen? And what can I do? How is it that this administration is here? And how is it also that there's so many people that are still fighting? There's a lot out there, and I still don't have answers to it. And if I'm thinking like this, and if I have so much that's on my mind, I know for a fact that a lot of people also need a place to talk about it. And um, not at a psychiatrist, but within their community <laughs> and with each other. And there's something that's very precious. Um, I think it's very... It took me a really long time to consider myself an artist until somebody said, oh, just for God's sakes, just do it. Because it's very brave to consider yourself, to call yourself an artist, and I still don't think I am because I keep learning. Um, although I'm at a table of artists, so it's very, um, it's incredible to be here. So, but I think that um, having said that, you make yourself extremely vulnerable when you present your work because you're taking all of this information, be it the news, the politics, perceptions, everything, you ingest it within yourself and then you produce a body of work. And I think good work, like I said, raises questions. So in my artist statements, I present questions at the exhibition. I don't really say what the work is about, but the questions that I was thinking as I was processing this work. And, um, that's the beginning of where I start these conversations with people. Um, and I think on the other, I think while the media is something that can be harmful, it is extremely helpful as well. And, and it's integral to have this relationship. Artists don't exist alone. Artists exist, of course, with their patrons. They exist with um, curators, but also with journalists and people who are willing to make your work relevant. 
And it's important to bring that out because you can also have these conversations with the journalists who are reflecting these questions, not only for you, but what are other people thinking? So I think it's, um, you know, the internet can be dangerous. Well, use it to your advantage. Understand how can you get this dialogue out, be invited, show up, <laughs> show up to your exhibitions. I mean, so these are, I hope that under, that's how I would navigate that. I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, over here. I have a loud voice. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Paulette, and I'm really uh, pleased to be here and enjoying your remarks and uh, looking forward to the exhibit I'll be there Saturday night. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I have so many questions, I will limit it to one, of course. The question I have is those of you who come from a Muslim background or are practicing Muslims, but come from a Muslim background, to what extent does Islam play a role in defining your art? I'm thinking specifically of the traditions of Islamic art, which, for example, include beautiful calligraphy, but also uh, prevent uh, the portrayal of the human figure. Thank you. Well, um, I'm a, a, a Muslim artist, a painter. I, I have a problem with that word as well. Um, uh, and certainly being a Muslim plays into, into my pieces, of, uh, I mean, subconsciously, really. I mean, my, my, the, the From the Outside series are mostly the, they're, they're, the women are nude, you know, and but I'm mindful of you know how they're portrayed, their backs or their necks or just, the, and so I'm within my sort of comfort zone there when I'm painting um, my my figurative work uh, with with my religion very much uh, within me, you know, um, coming out in my work, um, but it's not something that's. Um, I mean, I do paint figurative works. I don't, you know, I, I think that, that um, it's very open to interpretation. It's not something that's, uh, you know, set in stone. It's not something that at least, at least that's how I see it. And, and in Bahrain, and in, in, in my country and in my community, we are very liberal and we're very uh, open-minded about these things. So um, I don't see, I, I, I identify myself as a Muslim and I identify myself as a, a Muslim painter, um, and I keep to my traditions and my culture and my work, but in my own terms, if you will. So that's how I. Okay, let's let's hear from. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, and, and please say your name. And my name is Delphine Al Dahdah. I'm French and uh, Lebanese through my husband. Uh, but I've been working in the Middle East in North Africa for more than 15 years as a consultant in city development. So everywhere we try to build you know, vibrant cities and more inclusive cities, um, better functioning cities. And I'm glad to, I'm really <laughs> thankful to my friend Brigitte who took me to this wonderful panel today. Thank you so much. It's absolutely compelling because it's been over these 15 years when I was working with local officials, mayors, you know, politicians uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, nobody would acknowledge the importance of art. Like you see the budget of the ministries, typically the Ministry of um, Culture is so tiny and uh, at the local level it's the same. And I'm really happy that nowadays we see a shift, a change in, in at least in the mindset, not in the budget. Uh, but <laughs> um, I had two questions, um, a short one. Uh, one more social and at the policy level, uh, in your own personal trajectory, what is the first institution or person, but I insist on institution, uh, that really gave you the belief that you would be an artist? Like, when did you feel, I, I probably think you were an artist since, you know, ever, but um, who was or what was the institution that gave you this uh, strength or belief that you could become an artist? in the society, like a productive member of you know, the labor force. Like a, and um, the second one is more intimate, is when you create, uh, who do you create for? Like, 
who do you talk to? Is it like for the elder generation, the little girls that are going to come, uh, men, um, men from the West, <laughs> men from the East, like who, a grandfather, uh, politicians, I don't know, but who do you, do you feel your, you have this question and who do you create for? Maybe yourself or God, I don't know. Thank you. Thanks. I'll, I'll just say one or two things. Um, good mm. questions. Mm. And I would say, at least for me, um, I wanted to be a singer, but my dad wouldn't let me. You too? See, Tina Turner. Turner. So, <laughs> he's like, Everything. no, no, you go to art school better, better. <laughs> So I ended up at Syracuse University studying art and grateful for that. But um, so I would say family, uh, very strong. As an Arab father, conservative, I would say, but open-minded and, you know, probably he thought she'll just get married and be a nice artist or something like that. But, um, um, and secondly, I think I hope for the longevity of my work, whether it's the father stories that talk about generations that are passed down from generation to generation, or these issues of Arab Spring. I know about the politics and the beauty. I, I, I understand that totally. I agree with you too. Um, but these are times, times in our lives that, that artists record visually. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking of the Picasso painting Guerni Guernica. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that has a stain power and talks about a certain time, um, you know, that is important to, to remember, um, either to not repeat or to carry on, and we study it and we learn about these things. Um, I think artists are some of the more compelling ways of getting across history and, and making explanations easier for young people to understand. I mean, I, I hope some of my work, Prayer Rug for America, that is now at the Library of Congress, which was the piece that I did bringing East and West together in a, in a, in a restorative way, not a divisive way, right mm -hmm. after 9-11. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people know this, but someone just spit right in my face the day after 9-11, just because I look like what I look. I stopped saying I'm Arab. I, you know, they like, where are you from? I stopped that whole thing. The piece mm -hmm. that I, I did is uh, as if you're entering into a mosque, and I used the American flag, Islamic patterns, referencing what you were saying about um, you know, our backgrounds and the Arab world using Islamic uh, patterns in our work. Um, you know, hopefully these pieces have uh, a staying power, if you will, that can speak to the further generations after we're gone. I mean, that's, I don't even, I don't, I don't think it's egotistical. I, I just hope, please, yeah, inshallah, please let it just, yeah, <laughs> stay there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, hi, my name is Mimi Hassani, and I'm the liaison for the Middle Eastern uh, Group at the Office of Community Partnership in Montgomery County. Thank you so much for this presentation. You made my dream come true. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I just want to let people know that the, uh, the, cons the, uh, the idea about the Muslim women are oppressed, depressed, uh, is not really in Islam. Not, there is really not in the Quran we have so many rights that we are born with, and we have so much freedom written in our Quran. But the problem is the countries, our, our presidents, our leadership, the culture. So there is difference between the Muslim woman's role in the culture and the Muslim woman as a Muslim woman. Uh, I may walk behind my husband in the street, but at home, he walks behind me. <laughs> so uh, uh, we are born with so many rights uh, that we really pretend outside in front of you that we are oppressed, oppressed. But uh, if you get a chance, read the Quran, and you would learn that we are born with so many rights. And I'm so glad to see that you are doing the art representing our, our, our vision because art and food are universal language, and that's the only way we'll bring peace and we can work together 
and understand each other. So again, thank you so much. This was a comment. I don't have a question. So I'm so glad to meet each yes. one of you. Why couldn't so. you find the last one? That, that was really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah, yes, we have at the back. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Elizabeth Knudsen, and I am uh, in the field of language, French, and literature, and culture, and, and retired. And uh, I was interested in the point that Alia Ali began to make, I think, or touched on early uh, on about language and power. And I wanted to understand better the point you were making. I mean, for Morocco, you know, French, and Amazit, and even Spanish and Darija and <laughs> English too, uh, all play. And I understand a little bit about how that works in literature uh, and publishing and so forth, but just wanted to understand better what you meant by it and as a language, as a border, and anyone else uh, on the panel who had an idea about that too, I would love to hear. Thank you, Elizabeth, right? Thank you so much for the question. Um, hello. There we go. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so I, my, I start everything from language. Both of my parents are linguists. Um, so within the household, they share seven languages. But they, between them, they speak seven languages, but they only share one, which is English. Um, and so growing up between Sana'a, and Sarajevo and Istanbul and then traveling. So within the house, we always had English, Bosnian, Arabic, Turkish, and art. And it was, and I should say food. You mentioned food because I, that's probably the most important. Um, and so um, I, it was always interesting to me because from very early on, I realized how translations were happening and being able to see both sides and both the languages that actually a lot was lost in between. So um, when you're trying to reference specific words um, that in another language would actually take an entire paragraph to describe and it will never quite get it. But you get close enough. That's a whole, so it comes down to language really being culture. You know the saying, and you also as a linguist, where the more languages that you learn, the more lives you have. And I really believe that, and I see that. So um, fast forward, coming up to, and you know, I know Helen's talked about this, because it's been very, you know, this is also where, not even approaching it as an Arab, but approaching it as an American, you know, after September 11th, it was fascinating, and how I, I talk about this in my, in my statement, that language can also act as a disservice. Because um, one, who is it that you're communicating to depends on what level of language you have. That changes by age, by class, by... Um, secondly, what it is that you, once it gets filtered, and here's a perfect example that really affected me. So after t two weeks after September 11th happened, my father came home and he said, we're no longer speaking Arabic. It was, it was purely, we were living in Indiana at the time, and it was purely for safety. And one of, you know, because, and right now we still see this, where people are saying things like, Allah ma'ak, may God be with you, and get pulled off of a plane. Mm -hmm. So we haven't really moved on in terms of that, but I mean, hopefully we have in some respects. Well, one word that really affected me was also, um, was the word madrasa. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask you all to maybe, when you go home, to try this out while well, we all have phones. If you type in the word madrasa, M-E-D-R-A-S-S, -S, or one S-A, in English, in Google, and you go to Google Images, you will find boys and men in kufiyas in a Muslim school all boys, Muslim schools. If you were to write it in Arabic, mim, da, ra, sin, ta, you will just get an elementary school, boys and girls. You'll just get pictures of people playing, not really much of a hijab, it's just a school. And if you type in in English, S-C-H-O-O-L, you get the same pictures. 
this word to me was stolen. Because right now, if I were to use this in a greater context and say, I went to a madrasa in Boston, <laughs> there's a madrasa in Boston? Why, yes, plenty of them. So, <laughs> so this is an example of what I mean, how we cannot trust, and there's so many situations where, what is a word? A word is essentially sounds that have been put together, that have been given a meaning um, by us, by, by by context, and so that's why it changes, language changes, culture changes, and I think that it's, that's why visual language is more powerful because it's removing these and it breaks borders, so you're not applying a word to it, you're allowing other people to apply their own experiences to it. Um, I hope that explains it a little, a little more. We've got time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. And uh, please, please say your name and any relevant information. All right. I'm Mo Hello, thanks. My name is Mohini Malhotra, and I'm a development economist and an art collector. And I started to promote women artists when I realized all the art I bought as I worked on development issues were by men. And they were in galleries, and I was pretty gender neutral in my selection. And when I started to explore that um, and talk to women artists, they talked about there's discrimination as there is across many industries, not unique to artists. And I wanted to come back again to sort of the perspective that I picked up from all of you, which I totally, it resonates a lot, but this idea that, um, you know, it's um, ghettoizing women's art, perhaps. But I was curious, given how unequal the world currently is, what do you think about, do you see a need for women museums or uh, mm -hmm. proactive emphasis? on promoting women artists. Do you see a different narrative come out of what women care about and what the stories are that you're putting on canvas, you and other women artists, that perhaps warrant special attention until we get to that better stage when we don't need special or separate? You mean, do we need, do we need more, more museums do like we the need, National Women's Museum? Right, or do we need more women-specific shows? I mean, I think so. To be honest, not not even just because I'm a woman, but just like it's we we need it now. You know, we need the platform. We we need this platform. Um, so I I think it is very important. And then you know, talking about the label stuff, who cares? I mean, that's my that's my opinion. But I I, I think I, we do. Yeah. I I uh, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I think I think we uh, we need more platform, whether they're for women only or for everyone. I think we need more platforms to open up and show work of uh, women from different regions, because I, I think that work um, resonates a little bit differently and has some um, different messaging, perhaps, that we all need to hear. And I think what we need, in my opinion most, and I'm talking about the region, we need more women artists to come out and articulate themselves. And just to go back, you know, to your question about, you know, foundations or institutions that have, I think right now, whether the institutions are sort of putting a cachet on someone like you're an artist and you're not, I think people in general are coming out as artists because they feel personally that they have something to say and they are articulating it through their message, whether they're labeled as artists or non-artists. I know many of them are doing incredible work within their communities. They may not be known or they may not be shown in, in museums, but I think the value of this work now for where we are in the world is, um, is very, very important. We need more women to come out as artists. We need more men to come out as artists. We, we need, we need more of that. I just believe that um, a platform is certainly needed, um, any platform, but I think that as long as you talk about women as a separate entity, a woman's show, a woman's museum, a woman's, it will never be considered equal with any anyone or anything. You know, I, I think we need to be more inclusive. I think we need to be, as, 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 a, as a society, as the world, you know, we just need to be more inclusive and, Certainly there are um, places or platforms where women's works or women's, um, uh, you know, 
it's a choice that you make that you can choose to have that, you know, but I think as long as that's a thing, we, 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 we've sort of created a thing, then, then we have to sort of be enslaved by that thing. Absolutely. And then, so that's, that's my agree. issue with yes, that. Yes, yes, and that's, you know, we need more, more opportunities for art to be shown, whether it's for women yeah. or men, but we need to have that inclusivity to include the yeah, voices I mean, of a, women. A, a more a sort of interesting issue is how artists are, how can, how can an artist show, show their work? You know, um, this whole idea about the galleries and how, yeah. you know, how that's, that's a much more interesting conversation to have because, you know, you, we are not able to show our part and participate the way we, we want to. So um, that's something that the more open an artist can be with their work and the more power they have in how their work is exhibited and how it's shown and where it's shown, the more, you know, freedom they have in, in showing their work. So that's... That's more of an issue, I think, yeah. where yeah, artists are bound by, by, yeah, yeah. by the galleries. And I think we're all extremely grateful to have the opportunity to see your work in this exhibition, I Am, which through your words today and through your visual vocabulary makes us consider not just the question who I am, but who we are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much.